accounting standards. I like to start things with a bit of a quote. Um, so this um, is a quote from a man that is a lot wiser than I am. That wouldn't be hard. Um, this man came up with that, um, that the only constant in life is change back in um, 535 BC. So here we are in 2015 and we are in a whirlwind of relenting change. So what I'm going to spend the next 40 odd minutes on um, is looking at what's happening out there in the accounting space the regulatory space and the audit space. Now, how I normally run my sessions is, is not, we don't wait for questions at the end. If you've got a question around something that I'm saying, please ask it, because what I find if I'm sitting in one of these sessions, I'll have a really good question in my mind, and by the time the ends come, it's completely left my mind. So if you've got any questions, please pop your hand up, don't be shy, use and abuse me as much as you like over the course of the next 45 minutes, that's what I'm here for. Okay, I'm a bit of a visual person, so for those at the back, you'll probably um, struggle to see that. But the CFO today, what we really, what you guys really are, is that bottom um, that you're pulling your hair out. I've got some news for you. It's going to get worse. Whoops. Go back. Um, so you know, in the next few years, there are quite a lot of changes that are going to be happening. So. You know, you're going to um, go to the, the, the bathroom and you're going to think that's taking a break. Um, so that's what, that's what you're in for. And finally, um, Mr Bean here, you've never seen this guy again. He's happy with his job, he loves what he's doing. Um, everything's rosy, you know, everything's constant. Sorry guys, you're not going to see him again. Okay, enough with the fun and frivolity. Let's, start, let's go and um, look at some of the, the technical things. So what's happening out there in the accounting space is two sort of levels of activity. The first one is at the Australian level, and then I thought I'd um, take you on a bit of a whirlwind tour in, in terms of what's happening at the international level, because there are some projects internationally that, that are going to have significant bearing on, on what you guys do. So if we have a look at the first one, which is um, AASB 15, um, this one's been a long, long time in the making. There's been a lot of divergent thoughts um, at the international level, uh, both at the international accounting standards level and also at the FASB level. There's been a lot of toing and froing in terms of trying to get some, um, if you like, relative consistency across the globe with how we actually recognise um, revenue. You might think they're all oh, good. It's it's gone back again. It was first of uh, periods ending on the first of uh, January 2017. Oh, phew! We've got another year. Um, yes, phew! We've got another year. Um, but for a lot of you in this room, this standard is going to or the changes to this standard are going to be substantial. Um, and you're going to need to start thinking now where you've got um, revenue that has a number of um, different performance criteria. you're going to need to start thinking about how it's going to impact your business because it's retrospective. Um, so contracts that you may have in play now um, that, that hurdle 1st of January 2018, you're going to need to retrospectively make the adjustments. The one good thing is, is that we finally have a single model. Um, of revenue, reckon, which fo focuses on, on control. Um, there are going to be significant um, increased disclosure requirements. What a surprise. Um, so, yeah, need to, to focus our minds on that one. The good news is it will replace a number of standards and a number of um, interpretations. So, uh, 118's now out, obviously. Uh, construction contracts um, will be, again, consolidated into, to, into 15, and you can see there there is a number of interpretations that will also be impacted. There are some specific scope exclusions, um, lease contracts being one of those. Don't get too excited yet, because I'm going to come back to leases a little later. Um, insurance contracts, um, contractual rights and obligations under, under 9 and 131 being um, financial instruments. So um, there are a number of scope changes. So if we actually have a look at what the, exactly the model is trying to tell us, there's five steps. The first one is identify your contracts with your customer. 
identify whether there are separate performance obligations. Now, that's actually quite um, important because that's going to either um, that's going to mean there may be differentials from the timing of your revenue recognition. Um, you need to determine what exactly the, the transaction price is. Um, you're going to need to allocate the trans transaction price. And then finally, you're going to recognise revenue based on the performance obligations once they're satisfied. Now, at the moment, the, the, the scuttlebutt but around is this, this standard is going to predominantly affect just about everyone, unless you're a you know, a manufacturer of, of widgets and digits. So this is going to have a substantial impact and it, it, it's going to mean that what I would suggest that you do over the course of the next 12 months is take stock on the requirements of this new standard and what you need to do is start thinking about how it's going to impact your business. And it's going, it's, as I said, it's going to vary. Anyone got any initial questions? Everybody have got some awareness of 15 and the fact that it's coming? Yeah. As I said, please don't think I've gotten to 1 January 2018, yippee-doo, I don't have to do anything until 17, um, because otherwise you're going to find yourselves really absorbed um, at the last minute and panicked. Okay, so our friends in the not-for-profits. Um, this standard applies to you guys too. Um, and it's being exposed under 260 at the moment. Um, so the, the concept of reciprocal and non-reciprocal, gone. Um, the ACID test is really around um, the performance obligation. So those of you that are involved in, in either receiving or issuing grants, for example, um, that's, that's going to be quite interesting to see how that one particularly plays out because, um, as we know, some grants are specific some grants are not specific, some grants are a com combination of both. Um, so that's going to take some real head headspace to work out, um, you know, what the recognition um, and what once or determining what the, the performance obligations are. So it is going to take some, some, some time to work that through. Um, ED260 is likely to have the sa same timing um, in terms of um, implementation. At, at once um, AASB 15 comes out. So if you're thinking in your mind what's the timing, it's likely it's going to be around the same time. Okay, equity accounting. My favourite subject of all time when I was in the practice, not. Um, the good news is, is that you can now account for investments based on um, costs under um, nine or on the equity method under one, two, eight, um, if you prepare a separate, pair of, um, the, the, the separate set of financial statements. Um, so what that means is that um, if you've got consolidated um, statements for an entity um, with the subsidiaries, you can prepare um, individual accounts. So you can have two levels um, of accounts now, which, which for, for some organisations is going to be particularly helpful. Now here's one that's going to rock your world in the immediate future. So those of you that aren't aware, the um, AASB 119 employee benefits has a significant change for 30th of June 2015. So when you're measuring your um, long-term um, employee benefits or um, defined benefits, there's a new basis on which you have to um, discount, your, ca discount your, um, your cash flows, and that is using the corporate bond. So whereas previously you used a government bond, there's been research to suggest there's a deep enough market now for the corporate bond to be, to be, the, um, to be the, the, um, the, the go-to point. And I've put up on the slide here where you can actually reference, and you've got it obviously in your packs, where you can reference that information. Um, so basically now, what you need to do is you need to recalculate all your, all your, um, all your leave balances using the corporate bond rate. Um, that's going to have a P&L impact um, because the corporate rates um, are higher, which means your provision will be lower. Good news to some. Um, 
if you're looking at your defined benefits, that's a P&L impact for just employee um, entitlements. If you're looking at defined benefit plans, and that's going to have an impact on other comprehensive income as an actuarial, um, as an actuarial gain. Um, whilst it's not an accounting policy change, you are going to need to make note of it in your accounting policy note of the fact that you're now using the bond rate. Um, if it is a significant number to your organisation, i.e. its material, um, then you are going to need to disclose um, that there has been an accounting um, estimate change, so you'll need to disclose that. Um, for remuneration reports for listed entities, um, you're going to need to um, maybe um, add a disclosure for your key, um, key management um, people that you make disclosures around, you're going to potentially need to, uh, to explain why there's a significant change there. So there's several tentacles to this particular one change. We had some discussion um, last week on part of a large national networks discussion group and we were discussing where this is in fact likely to be material for, to organisations and we've identified within our group a number of companies that this will be. Um, there was some debate on what do we do as accounting firms if um, a, if a company doesn't apply the bond rate, um, that's something that you will need to have, obviously, if you think you're going to have a material ad adjustment and you don't want to make it, that's something you probably need to have a discussion with your external auditors if you are subject to external audit sooner rather than later. Because I think there'll be some varied, um, for, based on the discussion around the table, there's likely to be some varied responses from firms out there in terms of whether they'll, if it is material and you don't adjust, whether they will, in fact, qualify. So if you think you've got a material, I'd suggest you have a discussion with your auditors sooner rather than later. Related parties disclosure. The scope of um, 124 has been extended to include um, not-for-profits um, in the public sector. Um, so, sorry, we've got a question. It's effective at 30th of June and it's prospective. So you don't, so yeah, yeah. Um, so 124 related parties, as I said, that's being um, extended to um, not-for-profits in, in the public sector um, and that has uh, effect from um, reporting periods uh, beginning on or after the 1st of um, July 2016. Financial instruments, my subject matter expertise, not. Um, I avoid them like the plague. Um, there's been a substantial rewrite of that standard which will come into play on the 1st of January 2018. So that's reporting periods beginning on or after. Um, so again, I'm not going to spend too much on that today because that could be an entire presentation on itself. Um, and I'll be washing my hair that day so I won't be making it. So. Um, We've got some time here and, as I said, probably next year when we get a bit closer and, and some, of the, um, some of the intricacies of what's, how that's actually going to play out in reality, we can come back to. Okay, the IAASB lease standard. Many years ago, and sorry if you've been in a room with me before and you've heard this particular story, the head of the I... Um, the inter I'll won't use abbreviations because that's my speak, the head of the International Accounting Standards Board, Sir David Tweedy, was on a plane one day from London into, into New York and Sir David, God bless him, decided that it made no sense to him that the airline that he was flying did not have the aircraft on balance sheet. So he set about what has been some of the most tumultuous change that we will see in the accounting practice in years because he wants to see aircraft on a balance sheet. Bless him. As a result of Sir David's um, passion for said leases, we now have a leasing standard that will come into play probably in the next couple of years. It's likely that it will um, be cemented in a fourth, a fourth quarter of this year at the international level, probably with implementation around 2017, we hope. Um, basically, if we cut to the chase, what this standard's really getting to is previously operating leases weren't on balance sheet. 
they now will be. Luckily, we've gone away from um, setting standards on the lessor side, so the focus really here is on the lessee side. Um, so there are going to be a number of, of, of significant changes. So what I'll do is I'll go, okay. So we get this concept of right of use of an asset because effectively that's what, that's what we're coming to. For those of you who have leases less than 12 months that are operating in nature, status quo. That doesn't change. So anything with periods with a period that's greater than 12 months, you'll need to bring on balance sheet a right of use asset. And on the other side, obviously, you'll need to recognise um, the commitment um, by way of debt. Um, how you'll unravel that over time, obviously, is that you'll amortise the asset um, into your profit and loss account, so you're no longer you know, recognising rental. And that's going to have a, a, a seismic shift in terms of, um, you know, the timing. You're going to be amortising the asset faster than you would have been um, putting just a flat line payment through. That's going to impact your EBITDA, Kim's favourite um, topic of the day, um, and your EBITDA is actually going to increase. But the problem here, and one of the things that you are going to have to be very careful of, if you're a reasonably geared organisation, and you have a number of um, bank covenants, you're going to need to make sure in the not too distant future, you need to start having dialogue with banks around the potential impact that this is gonna have on your, on your ability to meet your bank covenants, because this will significantly play around with it. Unfortunately, whilst the profession um, and the regulatory bodies have tried to engage with the banks and get them to understand um, the potential impact, and I'm sorry if there's any banking people in here, I don't mean to offend, but generally speaking, the banks aren't understanding what's about to hit you guys. So if you do have complex um, arrangements with your banks, start engaging with them now. The tax consequences of this at the moment are actually quite unknown, which is startling. The big four have all had a stab at it, um, and everyone's still scratching their heads. I think once we get some, uh, some granulation, once the standard is completely stopped being played around with in the last quarter of this year, maybe some, some good minds will come to it. But there are likely to be tax consequences. So watch this space as, as firms like ours and others, we've got our tax guys working on it at the moment, ours and others come to you with some guidance on the likely tax implications um, of this, and as I said, there are likely to be quite a number of them. Just a quick one. Uh, does that cover property leases as well? The question is, does that, um, that does that? Um, do you have any property leases that are um, that are operating? Yeah. Okay. Well, my interpretation of the standard um, is that it is. But what I will do, because I don't want to misguide you, is I'll have a look at that during the course of the day, and I will find you later on today and give you a specific answer. I don't pretend to know everything. People around me try and pretend I do, but I don't. But I will come back to you. Now, the IASB um, have recognised that there's disclosure overload. <laughs> kind folk, aren't they? So they've given us some radical guidance. Not. So what they've basically said is, is threefold. Um, Companies have tried to get a bit sexy in the way that they to differentiate, differentiate themselves in their annual reports. And what this has created is more and more and more stuff. Because they've tried to, you know, obscure the facts with other bits and pieces of additional disclosure. And I think what the, what the um, IASB is really saying is try, try not to add too much other stuff because you're actually hurting yourselves. Isn't that useful of them? Um, one thing they have clarified is, is materiality applies to all aspects of the financial statements. So where you've got a standard that specifically requires disclosure, materiality applies. Now, I was trying to get my head around that last night because I know one of the things that we've always said around the related parties disclosure is materiality doesn't apply because that's been our interpretation of it. I think going forward, now that we've got this, cla this amazing clarity from the, um, the IASB, is that we've got some flexibility in terms of how we interpret 
the accounting standards and it's been specific in the fact that we should apply materiality. So that at least is helpful. Um, are they going to have half financial statements? Mm, sorry, no. So that's as, as much as they've been helpful to this point with the disclosure um, overload. So um, oh, one of the other things they've actually done um, is that they've said you can make, you can order your notes in your financials the way you think they make sense. So notwithstanding now in, um, in, in one that they've got a prescribed order, if you think another order suits your organisation better, then use it. Um, so that's probably the best I can give you under, on the overload side. Now I'm just about to walk away from the, the world of um, financial reporting. Any questions before I move on? All right, let's rock. Okay, so what's happening out there in the regulatory space is a few things that you need to be aware of um, come this 30th of June and, and going forward. Okay, remuneration report. Yay, we love it. Um, some clarifications here more than anything. Um, where you've got um, options um, that have lapsed, um, you know, due to, um, you know, not meeting vesting um, conditions, you no longer have to disclose the value of those options. You still have to disclose the number of options, but not the value of those options. So at least that is slightly helpful, so you don't have to value something that really doesn't, or spend the time valuing something that really doesn't have any relevance. Um, you also need to disclose, um, oh sorry, you no longer need to disclose the percentage of um, options to the person's uh, remuneration. Um, so that's, that's beneficial as well. The one really good thing I think in, in the clarification here, one that we've been grappling with for a while, um, is that they have now made it clear, I'll come back to you in a sec, they've now made it clear that 300A does not apply to non-listed disclosing entities. Because there's been some, you know, what do we do, what do we do? So if people have been quite conservative, and if you're in a non-disclosing, um, um, unlisted disclosing entity, sorry, people have traditionally been putting the numbers in, whereas now it's, it's, it's clear they don't. Sorry, yes, we have a question. Um, 30th of June. Yep. So the changes, uh, they were gazetted in March, I think. Um, so, yeah, from this year. Okay, a couple of things here. I put it under general meetings, but there's probably a couple of things that aren't related to general meetings. Well, they kind of are. Um, so, whereas previously you could get 100 shareholders together and, and call for a general meeting, um, old speak, they're the old EGMs. We call everything other than an AGM now a general meeting. Um, I'm from the old days. I, I still think of them as EGMs, but that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about a general meeting. Um, so you could get 100 shareholders together and you could call um, a general meeting. Now the change is, is that you need to have 5% of your total uh, voting shareholdings to call a meeting. The top uh, the 100 can still put in an item on the agenda, but what, what, um, what ASIC was saying is that you might have 100 shareholders that hold under 1%. So what they're trying to do is, is make sure that you ha don't have a, a small number of shareholders, or well, 100's not small, but you know, um, calling meetings, you know, that may not be entirely, you know, with the, the aim of the game of the, of the wider shareholding. So that's really what that change is about. Um, small companies limited by guarantee, and what I mean by small is less than a million dollars, um, no longer have to engage um, a um, external auditor. Um, if you think, I'm going to write that down very quickly, because wow, I'm in that space, and see you later, external auditors. Just be careful that your constitution doesn't um, trip you up and say that you still have to have an external auditor. So just be careful there. The other good thing is if you are in the, in the business of changing your financial year, um, there used to be a restriction under the Corporations Act that says you could only change it once in every five years. You can change it every year if you like now. <laughs> Please don't, but um, you have the provision there that you, that you can. Obviously, all of that um, um, is available now, and obviously, it's, it's prospective, so there's no retrospective um, application of that. Corporate governance principles, don't we all love those? Um, we're to the third tranche of it. 
or third edition of it, there are 22, oh, sorry, 29 recommendations in, in total and there are nine new ones. So the key changes um, are listed um, below. I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, you do have greater flexibility now because um, you'll note in some financial reports the amount of disclosures around the corporate governance pr uh, principles are quite extensive. Um, the benefit here now under these recommendations is you do have a lot more leverage to actually put it on your website. So instead of killing trees, there's an ability to put it on your website um, outside of the financial report. So that, that's, quite a, that's quite a good one. Um, the other one um, is even though they're non-prescriptive in nature, um, if you don't apply them, you have to note why. So, and you have to make that disclosure in your financial report or on your website. Um, the other thing for those of you who probably, um, who are in this space probably know, CFOs and CEOs are now required quarterly to sign off on, the, on their um, adoption of the, the corporate governance principles. Um, so as this is effective now from 30th of June, some people have early adopted because it's effective from 30th of June, this might be the first time you as CFOs, if you're in an entity that this is relevant to, are putting your signature to a piece of paper. So enjoy that. Um, the other thing too is you must lodge um, a 4G with your annual report, so that's the other, the other component here. Did I turn that off? Okay, continuous disclosure, ASX, our friends at the ASX, don't we love them? Um, basically on this one, and I'll, I'll, you've, you've got the benefits of the slide, so I'll just try and you know, cut to the chase with this one. Um, basically what they've been concerned about is giving um, potential existing shareholders and potential shareholders what they view as de facto um, earnings guidance um, through investor um, sessions, etc. They, they really want um, companies to move away from that, so they've got some stricter guidelines around that. So really the only time you go to the market is if you've got a market sensitive announcement to, to make around earnings. So what they, as I said, what they're trying to do is cut out all the excess noise and, and the confusion. They're also calling now, if you intend to hold an investor um, briefing, they want to see um, what in, in fact you are going to tell your potential investors and existing shareholders. So that has to be lodged with the ASX before you hold that. So that's another change. The ACNC. Okay, if you're in this space and you're praying to God that Tony Abbott was gonna get rid of it, bad luck, they're here to stay. The good news is though, is for those of you that are in this space, there are um, entities that submitted reports um, the first time to the ACNC um, because there are still some differences between local legislation and the requirements of the ACNC. They've, they've, re they've extended the transition arrangements so those arrangements still apply to 30th of June this year. I had a discussion with an interesting guy from the, ANC, uh, the ACNC last week and he gave me some wonderful facts that I thought some of you might actually be interested in. So of the 55,000 charities that are registered with the ACNC, 30,000 of those have lodged accounts. So if you're interested, if you're in this space and you're actually interested in financial statements, what's being lodged with the ACNC, unlike our friends at ASIC, you can go onto their website and have a look at any of sets of accounts that have been lodged. The bad thing for the people that haven't lodged already is it's very um, obvious to the ACNC who haven't lodged. The other interesting thing that, again, it's really at the small end of town, but if you have a charity that has less than $250,000 in revenue, you can actually cash account. So that was something I didn't know. So I don't know if you're interested in that, but anyway, I thought it was quite interesting. But I'm a boring person. People say to me um, at the dinner table, what do you do for a living, Liz? Oh, I'm a chartered accountant. It's good, and my specialty is international and Australian auditing standards. Really lights the fire. Okay. <laughs> Auditor resignation and removal. For me, I'm excited by this. Some of you might be too, but I'm excited. Previously, we were hamstrung in that um, auditor resignation or removal 
could really only happen once a year, and that was at the AGM. This is for in the listed space and corpse um, act space. Um, so from, I think about now, although we're waiting for the announcement, but ASIC are acting as if this was um, had force of law now, you can basically change auditors at any time. Now, if you are audited by William Buck, of course, you will never change. But other firms, if you want to come to us, you're more than welcome. So you can change anything. The only time, ASIC will only query you um, if they think that there might be some um, dubious reasons for change. And like, if you're changing your auditors in July or August and you've got a June year end, I don't like your, your chances of changing. So they, they do have a right of refusal, but from what I'm hearing from um, Doug Niven at ASIC, you know, th that shouldn't be a major issue. So it gives, it gives us all a lot more flexibility in the main. Okay, audit developments very quickly. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on auditor rotation, long form audit report, going concern and um, 720. So auditor rotation, there's two levels here, the firm level. Now the EU, for those of you that may know, they've got um, firm rotation now, which means they have to have a tender, a commercial tender every 10 years. An audit firm cannot, cannot audit um, a company for greater than 20 years. Doesn't look like that's on the Australian agenda yet, but we'll watch this space. At the engagement level, however, um, and this is still being debated globally, but I'll just give you where it's at in the global. Um, now it's looking like your key audit partner um, and all audit personnel can be on for seven, but they have to be off for five. So um, that is creating a whole lot of tension, um, both globally um, in Australia. In fact, there was an un unprecedented number of comments to an exposure draft. There were nearly 100 responses. We basically all said, no, we don't like it. Um, the um, international um, body said, well, we don't care. But luckily, the regulators have come in. So hopefully, um, by this time next year, I can tell you, we'll, it'll be status quo. And for Australia, for those that don't know, it's five years on and two years off. <laughs> I'm not good with technology. Right. Here's my feelings on this one. Oh, that was dramatic. That's my feelings on this one. Right. Just briefly, what does all this mean? So basically at a glance. Um, if you're in the listed space, and those of you that are in government bodies, don't sit back and relax just a minute because I'm coming back to you in a minute. If you're in the listed space, um, then long form audit reporting is effective for periods ending on or after the 15th of December 2016. So for those of you that have December year ends, that coming up to this December, really important that you start having a dialogue with your external auditors and getting a, a picture of what your audit report is likely to look at come December um, 31, 2016. And I mean that quite seriously because now, for those of you who haven't heard, the audit report's going to look quite different. Um, you're going to have key audit matters in the listed space. Again, don't relax too much, those of you that are outside the listed space, because I'm coming back to you in a minute. Um, and that is basically, in the auditor's judgment, what are those key areas that are going to be focused on or were focused on from an audit perspective and how were they addressed during the audit um, process? The opinion now, um, the actual opinion will be at the top of the um, of the audit report um, and the partner's name will be on the audit report. So whereas now it's not compulsory to have the partner's name on it, the partner's name will be on the audit report. There are a number of um, auditing standards that are affected by this. There's a new one, 701, which will actually define what a key audit matter is, or it tries to at least. And all of the other reporting auditing standards suite around it have changed as well, or will change. <coughs> If you haven't seen a long form audit report and you're interested in one, I've got a couple um, that, that we reference quite often um, as a, you know, a speaking tool is Barclays out of the UK or Rolls-Royce. There's a couple of different approaches. Interestingly, the UK experience who have already implemented this has seen quite a dynamic change from year one to year two. This is going to take a lot of head, head time of senior people in your organisations and your external auditors if you're in the listed space. If you are, by the standards definition, a PI, a um, public interest entity, stay tuned. It's coming to you shortly. The very much the um, 
Merrin, who's ch in charge of the um, Australian Auditing Standards Board, believes that this should be applied to um, pies. So that's coming. Now, I've told those of you that are sitting in the government sector not to relax too much. Um, Vargo, well, that's the Victorian Auditor General's office, and the ANO, uh, well, it'll affect all audit offices, um, are having discussions. They're going to, um, as best practice, adopt this on the, the larger um, government um, um, body. So um, you might like to have a discussion with your relevant audit office if that's your relevant to them and determine whether or not they're going to put, pop this on you. Because if they are, you want to be talking about it to, with them earlier rather than later. Okay, um, just on this one, it's interesting, um, there's been a lot of research in Australia and the number of going concern um, modifications, opinions, whether it's an emphasis of matter, qualification, disclaimer, adverse, whatever it is, is increasing quite substantially in Australia. The reason I raise this one is, is this is all related to the changes in the, the audit reporting, um, but on this one is where you are at the moment in the listed space and I'm your external auditor and I've come to you and we've had a discussion around whether we think there's a going concern issue or not and whether we're going to be focused on it. We go into have all this discussion but at the end of the day we're, we're happy early on that things are okay. Um, I still, under this standard, need to put a, a note in my key audit matters that it was a close call. To me, this is the most controversial part of all of this. My view is you've got to go and concern issue or you don't. That's the way, because we take a fairly strict interpretation. But please, those of you that are, have had discussions with your auditors on going concern and you are in this space, be aware of this close call concept. Um, it's in there, but I don't like it. Well, that's a really good... Qu the question is, is there guidelines as to when that will be applied? No, there's no definition, which is very, very helpful. So if you think you're going to be in, in that space, engage with your auditors early and, and make sure you've nutted it out. Just um, one of the final things is um, auditors' responsibility re uh, relating to other evidence. For those of you that produce um, financial... Uh, sorry, um, annual um, report... Quite often your financial statements, which are here, are often signed off by your external auditors and then the financial reports put together. I'm going to give you an inside word because this is what this is saying is your auditors have to sign off on what other information they've looked at. If you want to tick them off, here's a, here's a strategy for you. Put all, do all your other information disclosures in your annual report and not your financial statements because then they can't make comment on it. I didn't tell you that. Um, that that one, I'm, I'm not. I will I will find out the answer for you on that one. I'm not 100% sure because that's actually still in debate at the global level. So yeah, um, I started with a quote and I'll finish with a quote. Hang on. When you finish changing, you're finished. I used to, when I started in, the, in an audit practice in Coopers and Lybrand way back when, um, I used to have my, my gorgeous um, audit um, partner basically said to me, Liz, don't come to me with anything that's changed. I'll just hide under my desk and the next time there's a change and there's another change and there's another change and it'll circle back and then I'll become relevant again. I kind of look like this. Like, if we're going to keep going as CFOs and accounting professionals, we need to embrace change. Thank you.